Hey folks, come on here, come on, at your Shocktober service. And today we are sporting the ancient Mackenzie. Yes, look at that, it's absolutely beautiful. Of course it is. Now my family is actually part of the Mackenzies. Although, Graham, I know you're out there and you're asking about my heritage. Um, I am born in the Highlands of Wallasey. Oh, hey, the Whittle Peninsula, opposite Liverpool. Yeah, but the family is from Fort William originally. But I'm born down here, so I am a born again Highlander. Anyway, folks, uh, since my last video, which was about the glorious James Bernard score to Hammer's 1958 interpretation of Dracula, put out by the wonderful uh, Tadlow Music, and I was praising all of that, well, wouldn't you know it, some guys who actually had a hand in producing that album have spoken to me and reached out and said thanks and hello and my god you know I've, guys that means a hell of a lot to me honestly it really really does uh, lee phillips you came out with that fantastic track which i was really rhapsodizing over and uh my god i am absolutely stunned um i'll be getting back to you on that and uh mark bagby yay you know thanks again you know because you guys have really played an absolute blinder with this release what release, Killman? What release, you ask me? That release there. Yes. Not only does it have Dracula on it, it also has The Curse of Frankenstein, which came out the year before. Hammer really broke the mould of horror with that particular movie. Because you had lashings of gore, you're in colour, you are reinterpreting um, the old universal slew of classic gothic monster chillers. Of course, they could not get the rights to the Boris Karloff style makeup and they couldn't tell the same story either. So their own unique interpretation has the great Peter Cushing as the Baron, you know, who's a badass Baron. You know, this guy is so hell-bent on creating life from death that he will stop at nothing. And this is the big difference that they made, that Hammond made with that character throughout the entire run of, uh, what's well, any Peter Cushing's run, because other people did play, Ralph Bates played him at one point, the, the Baron in the rather lousy horror of Frankenstein. Uh, but Peter Cushing's interpretation was always unhinged. He was so completely steadfast. Science, no matter what you know, the repercussions are. And the monster he creates in this particular film, the first film, the minute it wakes up and the minute it claps eyes with its creator, it goes for him. It's already a monster. Boris Karloff was always very, very sympathetic as the creature. Christopher Lee, the imposing, towering Christopher Lee, who plays uh, the creature, the monster. They couldn't get the makeup rights for the Boris Karloff look, so he has this disfigured road crash look. He's scarred, he's ripped up. Initial appearances, he has a, a milky, glassy eye. And then later on, that eye's like black, and he, he's, <laughs> he's had impromptu brain surgery because the brain is damaged. And the Baron blames his buddy, his associate, his, uh, his assistant, Paul Kremp, played by uh, Robert Erkert. He blames him because Robert Erkert, Paul, Kre Paul Kremp, actually has, you know, a modicum of morality and doesn't really think that this is a good idea because it always seems to go horribly wrong. Every little experiment that the, uh, the Baron does, it, it goes tits up and people get hurt. And... Uh, so he actually you know, tries to stop him, trying to get the brain out of this, you know. <laughs> See, the Baron has actually committed murder. He wants a good brain, a proper scientific brain inside that dishevelled noggin. So he, his professor, he tricks him into like looking at a painting on the upper landing. And he's already cut the banister and pushes him over the banister. Now, if you watch that sequence, the professor, the stuntman, lands on his head anyway. And it's like, ooh! And you want the brain from that skull? And then when he's actually getting the brain out from the crypt, out of the body, Paul, you know, they have a struggle and the brain gets damaged anyway. So the Baron craftily, you know, always seems to drag Paul back into the, you know, the, the fray of like, who's to blame? Because you damaged that brain. Anyway. And so later on, the, the, the Baron does say something like, uh, oh, well, the, the brain's damaged, but I'll soon sort that out. That's a very swift operation. <laughs> because you're also an expert neurosurgeon as well. 
and you see later on the monster has a, a, a huge shaved patch you know a stripe going across his cranium where he's been obviously dabbling inside the head but you had the gore you had fantastic jack asher cinematography brilliant direction by terence fisher who would also go on to do dracula the year after the kensington gore a fantastically dynamic and aggressive performance from peter cushing and a brilliantly malevolent and yet sympathetic at a couple of stages performance from Christopher Lee who only makes an appearance halfway through the film but boy does he get to dominate you know any scene he's in he's brilliant in it so and he also had James Bernard to do the score Tad Lowe's production again Nick Rain and the Prague Philharmonic it's the main title Beautiful, isn't it? It's rich. There's depth to it. Punctuation, the symbols coming in. The music is bravura and it's in your face and your ears. Most British horror scores or genre scores hadn't been this aggressive, this over-the-top flamboyant and grabbing you, literally grabbing the audience by the throat. It's saying, prepare yourselves, there's going to be some shocks here, we're not going to let you go. Pull no punches. beautiful it's doom laden it's doom laden as well because the whole story is told Peter Cushing as the Baron is in a, a jail cell and he's about to be hanged for the crimes of creating this monster well actually we'll get onto that later but um, of the many murders that have taken place and the rampage through the countryside so he's gonna get hanged for his crimes and he's confessing all to a priest so he, the whole story is told in sort of like flashback bookended by this, you know, this gallows sequence. This now very elegant, learned sort of cue details the early life of the young um, Baron, played by Melvin Hayes, of all people, from It Ain't Our Hot Mum, British comedy show there from the 70s. And the weird thing about that sequence is, and this is, he's, he gets Paul Kremp to be his uh, his assistant and his tutor, but the two are gonna, you know, obviously their association, the Baron will obviously come to be the most assertive out of the, the duo. But the weird thing is, Melvin Hayes throughout this sequence then grows into Peter Cushing, who is quite clearly a hell of a lot older than Robert Erkert. <laughs> so there's been some kind of weird time lapse thing, you know, time distortion. But Melvin Hayes does a good good role, and it's quite a long sequence where he's the younger Baron. So in a film that's still a very economical sort of run shy of 90 minutes, there's a lot of stuff that's in it. Terence Fisher really does a great job at handling this, as he always did. Listen to this. Elegant, sort of pastoral. If you can hear some interruptions in the uh, in the background, like sellotape being unwrapped, unpeeled, there's various things taking place in another wing of Kilt Mansion. Just can't get the staff, can you? Listen to this then. Beautiful sort of chamber music. It's what people would obviously think would be, you know, uh, classical. But 
skullduggery is awaiting around the corner and shivering suspense. I've already said Peter Cushing's interpretation of the Baron is as a complete ruthless bastard. He's gonna marry, or does marry, um, the luscious Hazel Court. Oh my God, a redhead, but absolutely so spellbindingly gorgeous. She was also in Roger Corman's Mask of the Red Death. Oh dear, she is a beauty. And she's called Elizabeth. And, uh, but unbeknownst to poor Elizabeth, who can't go into the rooms where, my work, my work's important, don't go in there. He's also been knocking off the uh, the maid, Justine, played by, um, oh God, Valerie Gaunt, who would be, go on to play the vampire woman, the bride of Dracula in the following years, Dracula. But she gets pregnant. So what does the Baron do? He locks her in with the, uh, the creature who's already proved his homicidal tendencies. So, and it's horrible, you know. He's locked her in to be savaged by this brute. Yeah, that's turn nasty there, sinister. Because these experiments aren't going to be for the betterment of mankind. Despite his lofty aspirations, he's in it for himself. He's in it for vainglorious vanity. Spiritedness. The strings. They're like little whippoorwills, aren't they? Cavort around. It's like fledging experiments to, to bring back a puppy from the dead. And it works. There's one I brought back from the dead a little bit earlier. And it aged quickly, just like Peter Cushing did. Beautiful stuff. Angular, sharp, jarring. When the woods come in like that. Is, that. is that the bassoon? The oboe? Oh, it's beautiful, isn't it? This is a much shorter soundtrack than Dracula. But it's no less powerful. A clever device that they used was that James Bernard did not score any of the creation sequences where Frankenstein and Kremp have this laboratory up in the attic of this you know, luxurious mansion. The only sounds you hear are the bubbling of vats of water and acid and the circuit breaking on you know, all the electronic paraphernalia, wearing oscillations and crackling static. And that becomes the soundtrack. And in a, in a way, it's a great, it would be a great track in its own right. A bit like a sort of embryonic um, Forbidden Planet by Lewis and B.B. Barron, which was purely electronic, but you had that, that, the sound of oscillations and generators. You get the depth there, and you get these slashing wells, which are set to, you know, get your nerves jangled. A lot of it slower than the Dracula score and the music that James Bernard would go on to do, where he would actually hit the ground running in most of the year, the later Hammer scores, and he'd be pounding insistent and relentless. So, where should we go to next? Well, obviously, obviously, we're going to go to the creature. Swathed in bandages. The first time you actually see the creature. And he's standing there. Victor walks in there and he 
Christopher Lee pulls the, the bandages across from his face, revealing this distorted road crash, road kill, pizza face. And an undercrank camera zooms in to his face, recapturing what James Whale did in the first Frankenstein movie, where the, the Frankenstein, the monster first turns around and we, we cut staggeringly into his face for a close up. Ah, just love the depth of that. You get these piercing, what would later become a Bernard Herrmann style, but then you drop the, the whale so that the trap door opens beneath you. Boom. The little decoration, the little, you know, percussion that creeps in, having little flourishes here, little bits of punctuation. The creature tries to kill its creator. Paul Krem comes in, smashes a chair over its back. They strap it to a table, but it still gets out, gets out, and then goes and kills. You know, in most stories, he meets a blind man and at his friend. Friend! Not so here. Bloody kills him. And he also kills the, the poor blind man's grandson as well. And then, you know, our two hapless heroes, anti heroes, are out hunting him. Both got shotguns. We know Victor doesn't really want to hurt. He, just, he wants to keep this thing alive. But poor Kremp knows it's evil. Bang! <laughs> and Christopher Lee takes that shot and the Kensington gore spews out of his head and he hits the deck and Victor just goes like good shot or good shooting always oh, sinuous and sly when the woods just creep in and weave around coiling like a snake it's clever stuff comes across so beautifully as well. See how now we're in the, the second phase of the score and things have taken on a, a darker, more suspenseful edge. And James Bernard is a master of building on these things. This is a film where people often creep into rooms where they shouldn't be. We know something's in there. And they're just like investigating. Got a lantern. What's around there? And as they get nearer, the music begins to build and build and build. So we get like a senses paralyzing reveal. James Bernard, listen to this now. He reaches such a point where you think he can't go any higher, and yet he always does, he always seems to go a little bit further than you expect him to be able to. You've got bass, you've got percussion, you've got these squirrely strings, and the cymbals come in. The music goes up and down, up and down. It literally is a roller coaster. Some kind of monster thudding up and down the stairs out there. Folks, I do apologize for these rather rude interruptions. I'll be having words with the staff later. Heads will roll. It's Halloween tomorrow, so... 
I will have my vengeance. Justine's faith. This is the, the girl that gets lured in there, the pregnant maid. Dearly me. Well, this is it. See, this is the thing about Peter Cushing's interpretation. He, he becomes a sadist. In a later film, he will commit rape himself, rape and murder. And, uh, you know, he has no qualms at all. He even puts, because Paul Kremp says, like, you know, look, he tries to warn Elizabeth, you know, get out because what he's doing in there. Well, but what is he doing in there? And, like, Hazel Cook is one of these, as gorgeous and voluptuous as she is, she's what and where? Ooh. There's a lot of huh, in everything she says. Who, wh whence you came? Where do you go? When will you be back? But he tries to warn her, get out. What your husband's doing isn't right. So he said, I want to learn. I want to learn about science. So when Paul threatens to tell, you know, Breton's face, look, I'm gonna tell her, I'm gonna tell the villagers, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it whatever I can to get her away from here. And he says, Well, if you don't want to help me with the experiments, maybe she will. Yeah, she has a keen interest in science. But in other words, like, you know, if I introduce it into into my world behind that locked door in the laboratory, it's game over for her. So maybe it's best that you stay and help me out. You pass me that bucket and that sponge when I'm mopping someone's exploded cranium next time. The image of the creature as well, he has a, fro a black tight frock coat on, which goes down to past his knees, very narrow. You see him hanging from a, a meat hook at one stage. And he, it's a brilliant, brilliant image. Brilliant look. It was later adopted by uh, the Italian you know, godfather of gore, Lucio Fulci. When he did, he cobbled together the, the rather demonic Dr. Fraudstein down in the basement of the house by the cemetery. He wears a similar, well, he wears an identical frock coat, and it is on purpose. It is to mimic, you know, the creature from Curse of Frankenstein. I mean, the name Fraudstein is obviously a connection as well. Lots of suspense. I always viewed the, 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 the score for Curse of Frankenstein as being a lighter, less demonstrative and, you know, ferocious score than Dracula. But really, you've got so much ladling on of suspense. And these big builds and these mini crescendos and these little sustains. The dog's yawning now. <laughs> These beautiful, shivery reveals, and you can feel the revulsion of the characters when they, they, they spy what's coming for them. to a kind of furious Helter Skelter get up, final confrontation and the guillotine pretty much sums up the entire final act of the movie because he's worked on the brain of the creature now and the creature's become pretty much a dumb animal and uh, <clears throat> he's kept chained to a wall and Victor the you know Frankenstein is very keen to show off how it, it can respond to commands now and he's showing off to Paul, who still wants, like, look, 
we can't be doing this anymore. Stop trying to convince me. And he says, look, it responds, look, get up. Get up. Come forward. Come forward now. And he's, he's a bastard, you know. There's no other version of Frankenstein who's been so horribly, uh, you know, assertive, nasty, and single-minded. They're always portrayed, Colin Clive in the first, you know, Frankenstein, it, obviously the Boris Karloff one, you know, he's, he's single-minded until he's created a monster, and then he's just, oh no, no, he's angst-ridden. Every other version, like in Mary Shelley's original novel, they all go through this crisis of conscience. What have I done? What have I unleashed? It's wrong. Not Peter, Peter Cushing. Oh no, he revels in it. Revels. And again, like in Dracula, he's very sort of, in fact, he has more action in this movie than he does in Dracula. He has a couple of confrontations with the creature. He's getting thrown around. The creature will pick him up. Oh, like that. And, you know, it's off the ground. It's a pure Darth Vader rebel, rebel commander moment. And of course, both Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee would later star in Star Wars movies. The poor creature will end up being set ablaze. He'll be shot. He'll have a pistol thrown at him. He'll then be set ablaze and he'll go crashing through a skylight window into a vat of acid. Talk about overkill, you know? But this, of course, is when Hazel Court, Elizabeth, she now needs to find out what the hell he's been up to. So she'll go and investigate. In the meantime, the monster's broke free of its, you know, the chain in the wall, pulled it out. And then he begins to tease Elizabeth because he's, he's, a, he's on the, the roof and he sees this through a sky and he pushes through a pane of glass and then hides out the way, luring her up onto the rooftop, showing cunning on his part as well. So James Bernard just accompanies all this with more of this scintillating suspense. And it's almost a cliche, isn't it? The, the, the shivering strings and then the uh, 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 menace. But it sounds so good. There's a reason why it's a cliche. It's because it works so damn well on its initial, you know, unveiling. So people then copy it. It's dark, isn't it? It's macabre. Folks, the footsteps are not on this glorious recording by Tadlow. drop down again. It's almost like a, literally like a, a roller coaster. A bit more dynamic. It's brilliant, isn't it? Pace accelerates. Of momentum. They don't see the monsters on the roof. Paul's gonna go and get the villagers. 
Victor's going to run up there. And you see Peter Cushing hurtles through the air, the mansion, running up and down corridors, up and down stairs. Sort of relentless momentum there. Tussling, battling. macabre style, you know, cavorting there. Folks, your little time limit on my recordings is about to kick in. We're almost at the very end of the score anyway. Um, the final cue is about the guillotine where he's going to face death because Paul just says, no, 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 there was no creature. He made, he did the killings. It's all his fault. And he said, Paul, Paul! Please tell them it's true. No, leaves him to face the gallows. But of course, Frankenstein will escape the gallows and make many more film, films as well. So, folks, there they are. It's heading towards the end. The noose. The guillotine, even. <laughs> In a film where he's been taking heads off, it's only fair that he should lose his. Folks, in the meantime and in between time, you guys have fun out there. Make sure you pick up your copy of Tadlow's exquisite release. And I'm going to see you all later for Halloween. It's alive! It's awake! <laughs>